Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Festival of Ideas Online. My name's Andrew Kelly, Director of Festival of Ideas, and I apologise for the delay in starting. We've had a few technical issues to deal with. Um, one of our themes in, in our work is the city and the future of the city and making the city and cities everywhere work for all. Our biennial festival of the future city addresses this in detail. There's been talk about the pandemic meaning the end of the city, whether that be people wishing not to live so close to each other uh, and in the, the death of the office. Much of this is speculation. Cities are resilient and have been through many crises in the past and most have survived. But as with all our work on cities, it gives us a chance to look again. This crisis gives us a chance to look again at the city and Bristol and making it better. This session, which we're running with Business West, is a chance to look at the long term future of the city. And we're delighted to be joined by three of Bristol's four MPs. Thangham Debonair, Member of Parliament for Bristol West and Shadow Secretary of State for Housing. Darren Jones, Bristol Northwest and Chair of the House of Commons Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Committee and Karen Smith, Member of Parliament for Bristol South and Shadow Northern Ireland Minister. Please put your questions to them in the box below uh, and please add comments in the chat as we go through. We'll come to you as much as quickly as we can. I've asked each of, the, uh, each of our guests to say something in advance. I'm going to start with Darren as we seem to have most of the, the technical problems with him, but he can still speak to us. So I'm going to ask Darren to start by telling us a bit, uh, talking about business and the future of business. Darren. Darren, you need to start. Well, well thank you, Karen, and thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be with you here for the second um, MP's question time. Um, for those of you in the audience that um, are a bit confused by the technology, I can only hear Karen. So Karen is my translator. Um, for the whole event today, uh, but hopefully that means we'll be able to take your questions and you'll be able to hear the answers. Um, I've been asked today to talk about um, the future of the city from the context of the work that I um, do in Parliament um, as Chair of the Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Select Committee. So it's my role um, on behalf of the committee to hold the government's uh, base department to account, uh, which includes business and industrial strategy policy, COP26, the net zero transition, um, and um, UKRI, so research and innovation spending through universities and industrial research and development. So quite a good brief. Um, and the question I've been asked to think about today is what does that mean for, for Bristol and for cities in the context of this uh, COVID world? Um, and I think what's clear is that we're going to be having a significant fiscal investment uh, in order to get the economy back on its feet. And that presents an enormous opportunity um, for us in the country to solve some of the underlying economic issues that we had prior to the pandemic, now that we're opening up um, public spending and thinking about how we can create an economy that we can all um, do well in and, um, and, uh, and be proud of in the future. And I've long called for a fiscal stimulus in the economy, which deals with two issues. One, uh, in terms of automation uh, and technological transformation of the economy, and the second on the net zero transition. And I think both of those are areas where Bristol can lead uh, and where Bristol is leading and where I hope we'll be able to continue to do so um, in the future. The first thing I would say on automation, we've seen already quite a lot of this in Bristol, but primarily in some of the bigger businesses and then also some of the very innovative startups. And we need to see it kind of stretch across the broader economy, especially into our SME supply chain. And I think one of the huge opportunities for us is how we can start to partner better between the kind of big businesses and the innovative startups and share that expertise and insights across the broader supply chain. And so whether that's about uh, amendments to, for example, the apprenticeship levy, which I know Karen is um, working on um, as chair of the APPG on apprenticeship, so that big businesses like Airbus or um, Rolls-Royce, for example, or some of the big supermarket chains that have gone through lots of digitization are able to place digital apprentices into their SMEs to help SMEs um, to go through that process or whether it's about future um, training opportunities and partnerships across those organizations. I think we have a great ecosystem in Bristol um, where we can not only achieve these things for workers and businesses and for us as a city, but also share that expertise with the rest of the country and indeed the world. But the trouble with this automation, and I've long called for an acceleration of this, which of course we've seen um, as a necessity through the pandemic, is that it does cause a lot of destabilization, whether in terms of the way in which we do our work, the changing fuel requirement in the workplace, and transition from older jobs to the newer jobs in the economy. And so the, the state has a role to play in adding these stabilizers to this, whether it's about making sure we have proper in-work training 
um, with the with the provision, whether it's from FE providers or from trade unions or from the workplace itself, to ensure that people are able to adapt and build their skills bases within the workplace. And this is going to be really important in the face of redundancies in the city, where I think the government should be spending money to keep people in work in order to train and upskill themselves, but also the new generation of workers, instead of allowing people to go home and to claim um, universal credit, where it's much harder to deliver these training requirements. Uh, but also, we've seen the consultation from the government on reforming business rates, a discussion today in the press about an online sales tax. We're starting to talk about the tax system and how that might help us as we transition to the digital economy, but also make sure we can maintain um, uh, our communities and the high streets at the heart of our communities and what that means in the transition. And net zero applies to all of this too, because we know that every part of the economy has a lot of work to do on decarbonisation. Um, we've been very good in the power sector. We are going to start feeling, seeing a rollout now across buildings and energy efficiency. We need to see more in terms of gas heating. But for us in the city, the key challenge is going to be decarbonising transportation. Um, and I know that our Mayor Marvin Rees has included a lot of that in the One City Plan, and I hope that we'll become a test bed for more of these um, decarbonised but also automated um, mo mobility solutions in the um, uh, in, in the city. And I think um, there was a great piece in the FT weekend the other weekend on the 15-minute city, the idea being that you should be able to cycle or get short-distance transport within 15 minutes of your home to get to the key functions that you need every day. So when you bring all of those issues together, you might end up, for example, in a situation where our high streets have got gigabit broadband connectivity, where you've got um, closed high street units owned by the council, which become community working spaces, where we start to think more about cycle lanes or um, uh, electric vehicle automation in smaller radiuses so that we can start to um, uh, have this more automated and decarbonised lifestyle in our own communities and not just in certain concentrations in the city, which is what we've had to, um, which we've had to date. I, I have no idea whether that was my time or not, because I was a little distracted by all the technology going on, but I'm just going to leave it there and hope for the best. Uh, thank you, Darren. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming you still can't hear me. So, Karen, you are our translator to Darren for us, I'm afraid. So, um, um, Karen, I'll come to you next and we'll hopefully get Thangam back as well. Um, I was reading your blog and was reading some of the things that you've, you've put on there uh, and about um, particularly I was one of our key themes is about women and coming out of COVID-19. Is that something you can talk about for us? Yeah, very happy to, Andrew. And I must admit, my new exalted status as being the one person that seems to be able to communicate with Darren is, is something I'm trying to think what on earth I can share with him from the entire of Bristol right now uh, to keep him connected. But it, it's an example of the times we're in, aren't we? So it's great to be able to do this this afternoon. Um, but obviously, we've got a few uh, difficulties. Um, um, but we're overcoming them, aren't we? So, um, I mean, I think generally the pandemic has shone a light on some existing problems, um, but um, it does highlight some of the things that we really need to think about and to do different. Um, and one of the, the key things that, for me is that around education and particularly early years and post 16 and adult provision to train people up for the future that we're expecting to see. And one of the most important things we saw when schools um, had to close down to all but essential um, children of essential workers was the impact it's had on children, particularly those from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds. Um, and it's clear that if we're going to improve the life chances of those young people, then we're going to have to do something quite substantial now in terms of early year provision. Uh, surpassing what we did as a Labour government um, through the noughties, which really did start to make a difference. And if we fail to do that, we are going to see some devastating consequences in the next 10 to 18 years. We also need to do something very radical around post-16 and adult education. There is no point in talking about the jobs of the future or whatever type of society we have if we cannot train and skill people up to those jobs right now. And the, fir the, the current model the people that can do this, um, but the current model of funding stops them, is the, the further education sector. Um, the current model is inadequate, it's unsustainable, and it's an afterthought in terms of policymakers, uh, because primarily most policymakers tend to follow the very traditional uh, school A-level university route, and they have very little experience of further education. And the City of Bristol College, if it's properly supported to do so, can be has to be the foundation of the recovery in this city. Another emerging theme is around care. It's been clear for years that the social care model is not working. 
Paying for care is expensive, but simultaneously care workers, the disproportionately women, are in poverty pay. Um, expensive and totally inflexible provision means it's very difficult to be a part-time carer. So those who are caring, for example, for older relatives, again, overwhelmingly women, completely give up work to do so, plunging families into greater poverty at a crucial time in that family's life, which in turn makes uh, retirement for predominantly those women more precarious. And fixing that problem, the care problem, has to be the first call on all our infrastructure thinking. Because infrastructure is not about roads and buildings, it is about how we support people in order to be able to access work and the opportunities that they want. Um, and you know, all of these sectors predominantly affect women. And we have to be honest about the reason we don't talk about it again in terms of policy making is that women are not at the table when these de decisions are being taken. Women have been worst affected in this crisis. More than a third of my constituents are employed in retail, warehousing or healthcare, and most of these are women. Um, working from home is often hailed as, you know, the, the panacea uh, flexible working is good, working for home for people who've got office based jobs is good. But I think it's really interesting that we've spent decades as women trying to inch our way slowly, slowly into the public, public sphere. And we are now really in risk of being pushed back into the home um, and not being at the table when the key decisions are being taken. Most most fields that are talking about this now are male dominated business leaders, mayors, union leaders, all overwhelmingly male, as is the Conservative Cabinet. Um, now, Bristol is unusual in having three women MPs, but apart from my colleagues' sheer brilliance, um, actually the Labour Party employed all women shortlists for all of those positions. Um, and it was that that really helped uh, propel us to having an unusually high representation of women leaders. Um, and before I pat ourselves on the backs too much, let's remember that in this progressive city, the only statue to any women is Queen Victoria. So it's clear we've got an awful lot of work to do. Finally, um, I'd just like to, to put on um, into, the, into the discussion the issue of what we call place in future services planning. We've seen a most extraordinary response by our community organisations during this crisis. Uh, for many years, they've been sort of part of uh, the system, uh, so occasionally being consulted, but really being talked to. Um, and they have absolutely stepped up in this crisis. As, as one here in my own constituency talked about, they were built for this crisis and they have responded absolutely magnificently. Going forward, they have to be a partner in the recovery. It's really important for things like if we have a lockdown in Bristol, you have to uh, have people from communities who are trusted in those communities to lead something like a local lockdown, but they can also lead what sort of economy we want back in terms of particularly transport, sustainable housing and all the things that sort of the big policy picture things that we talk about but it has to be rooted in those communities and I think that's really important also for another one of your themes today Andrew around future democracy. The current government hasn't shown itself particularly willing to let go of let go of power. It doesn't respect devolution. And we've seen recently a recent white paper on the internal market when we take back some powers from Brussels. They look like they're going to be centralised uh, in London, as well as a new white paper we're expecting on devolution. Again, sucking power from communities back up to metro mayors, which the government see in England as the solution. That doesn't bode well. We've got a patchwork of metro mayors with varying powers and very little money to uh, effect the change. Now, I have never been particularly in favour of the mayoral model for all sorts of reasons, but primarily because it doesn't root power in communities and it doesn't root trust and democracy in our communities and it overwhelmingly favours male leaders. But if we are sticking with the mayoral model, then we've got to do something quite radical to re-empower local communities and the local councillors that represent them. OK, we'll, we'll be coming back to some of those themes. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, Thangam, um, your shadow Secretary of State for Housing. So tell us a little, and, and this is one of the, the big long term problems that cities have tried to deal with for a long time. And we celebrated the, the centenary of the council estate last year. What, what's the future of housing from your perspective?
Now I can't hear. Um, sorry, Thangam, I can't hear you now. Um, Karen, could you hear? Thangam okay, let there? me try again. There's too many bits. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Me now. Yeah, right. that's it. Yeah, that's there. great. Yeah. Those are the words everybody loves to hear, aren't they? You're on mute. <laughs> Just a joy. Uh, so uh, the first thing I learned about housing is everybody has an opinion on housing and understandably so, because everybody either has one or wants one, a home that is. And I think the first thing we learned in COVID is that making sure that everybody has a home is everybody's business, because suddenly after years of successor governments saying, oh yeah, we'll get round to solving the rough season crisis, suddenly it should be solved over a weekend because it's ev it affects everybody when there are rough sleepers in the, in the middle of a health pandemic. So everybody should have a home. Everybody should have a home that's safe and secure. And again, during the COVID crisis, we learned what that meant, depending on what political choices you make. So people who are in poor quality, unaffordable, expensive, often privately rented, but not always, accommodation have really struggled when they've lost their job or lost 20% of their income as a result of going on to furlough, or in many cases gone on to universal credit, where the current benefit system, often to their surprise, does not cover their costs. Everyone should have a home that is powered by renewable energy, if possible. Um, why does that matter? Because we're in a climate change crisis as well as a COVID crisis. And I'm hoping that in the course of the next 20 years, we'll be giving the climate crisis the priority it needs. Um, but also people started off this crisis, uh, which is caused by a respiratory illness in homes that were often expensive to heat or impossible to heat and drafty and damp and mouldy. And again, that comes back to deciding whether or not we make quality of housing a priority or not. And when we have a health crisis that's a, it's based on a respiratory illness and then has economic consequences, all of those already underlying problems, they were all there already, they are exposed. They're like a blue light exposing all of these things that are already there. And some other things that I think we've learned during the COVID crisis so far about housing is, first of all, everyone's Wi-Fi should be better. I think <laughs> we all know that. <laughs> but it's not something we can take for granted because suddenly on March the 27th, everybody's bosses expected them to have great Wi-Fi and expected them and their flatmates and their partners all to be able to be on Zoom with multiple other participants in the same Zoom meeting all at the same time. And our internet ain't built for that. I had some classic lockdown moments of standing in the middle of the road outside my house, holding up a laptop and iPad and a phone, trying to get a signal on one or other of them and failing and having to call somebody with one ear and try and get a signal with the other ear. Now, which of us on this call has not had that lockdown experience? And office space at home cannot be assumed. Again, we've all had a window into each other's homes during this crisis. And for some people, the window that I've seen is that they were required to work from a condition that was not really suitable to working from home. They've been sitting on beds, they've been managing on sofas, they've been at opposite ends of the kitchen table from their partner having to take it in turns and home educate their kids all at the same time. Our homes were not built for this. Arguably, maybe they should be. Because I now hear that there are some bosses who are thinking of rather than letting their staff come back to the office, thinking of buying them garden sheds. That presupposes that they've got a garden to put a shed at the bottom of and also that there aren't other consequences of keeping everyone in a very atomized location. I myself, I'm okay saying this, I have found it very difficult to walk downstairs into this room every day at half past seven in the morning and basically stay here until 10 o'clock at night. I've found that very difficult. And seeing people's faces on screen is not the same. It's just not, and I can't believe I'm the only person to have found this difficult, but I know I'm not. So the mental health consequences of housing need to be considered in the light of, do we want to work more from home? And if we do, what are the consequences of that for our mental as well as our physical health? And again, Sure, I'm not the only one who's put on more than half a stone. Um, the digital infrastructure and digital exclusion questions need to be built into our thinking about housing. So if, for instance, my mum had an Alexa, which honestly, I wish she had had during this crisis, but she's kind of learned to work around it. But maybe it was time that we accelerated that so that we could actually have more instant communication between homes when we needed it, when we couldn't do anything else. But also, I think we've really learnt that a role that maybe quite a lot of people, politicians included, have mocked over the years, which is that of placemaker. My goodness, how much does that matter? It matters all the more when neighbourhoods and neighbours are lifesavers and are, have been the answer or part of the problem. 
if you don't have good neighbours who are going to do your shopping in the last four months, how would you manage if you were shielded? And no, don't nobody can tell me that the shielding programme and support that's been put up by the council isn't good. I know it is. But actually, the loneliness, the anxiety and the confusion that's been caused by being in those separate blocks of housing without neighbours at least willing to shout through the window at you to check you're in one piece. I think that's been really troubling. So a couple more thoughts just to chuck into a controversial discussion, I hope. I would prefer that nobody ever again builds any home of any size or any sort without access to green and open space, good, decent digital infrastructure and a connected feeling to their neighbours in some way. I've really seen the difference in my constituency. I have 36 tower blocks. There are two next to each other over in Lawrence Hill, one that everyone has access to outdoor space and one that everyone, nobody has it. And my hypothesis, which I'm willing to bet on is that people have suffered differently in those two homes those two sets of, of council blocks and i think that's really important i think there needs to be more respect for placemaking as a role and for neighborhoods and communities and for local councillors as karen has said my local councillors in my patch i think have been extraordinary they've known their patch to the last inch and they need to be involved in making decisions about what is built where for whom and how because the how matters just as much as the where and for whom because it needs to be in a way that gives local people jobs because if we're going to build a load of homes which we obviously need to we need to think about not just where they're going to be built but who's going to do the building who's going to get the benefit of those construction jobs i want them to be our, cons our constituents primarily without being overly parochial about that i don't want them to be people who have no stake in our communities because i think that they will make better houses i might be wrong about that and i really I really feel that everyone thinks that housing is the problem that they can solve and the more time I've spent on housing over the last four months the more I've realised it is a very naughty problem with a lot of policy levers that look easy at first sight and have got all sorts of unintended consequences but I think we all need to be part of the discussion to solve our housing crisis. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much Thangam. Um, I wanted to just put a couple of questions to all three of you before opening up to the, the questions from the, the audience and I Repeat again, if you if you want to ask a question, put it in the ask a question section and we'll, we'll get to as many as you can. The first is, is following up something that Karen said about care and about social care. One of the big issues that comes up in lots, lots of times in whatever we do, whether it's about economics, whether it's about politics, whether it's about um, placemaking, whatever, is about the failure to address long term social care. And this is one of the big issues facing us all, not just cities, but, but cities as, uh, as well as any others. The, the government this morning has floated an idea that those over the age of 40 should have an extra tax put on them to, to pay for, for social care. I don't want to particularly talk about that, but it, it's really about long term solutions to social care that, that we can come up with. And, and it's been you know kicked into the long grass for a long time. I'm going to start with you, Thangam, because I think Karen might have to tell Darren what we're asking here because of the, the way communication's going. Can, Darren, you can't hear us yet, I think. Is that right? No. OK, I'll start with you, Thangam, then I'll come to Karen and then to Darren. I think, and again, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to reference COVID again, because I think as we design a social care system that works, we need to think about what we've learned from having one which was has really failed not only residents but workforce in the last four months where people whose jobs did not feel valued were suddenly told they were key workers but were not given the kit to do the job which was literally life-saving so i think we have an opportunity now to do something which a young campaigner years decades away from leading social care himself said to me in the 2015 general election that he felt that digitization um, of um, our workforce should allow us to reappraise which jobs really really matter now he said this to me in 2015 and blimey was he right and that if we know which jobs really really matter we should be thinking about how we recruit train qualify and pay those people and decide as a country that if we really think social care really matters then we have to pay accordingly but we also have to stop thinking about social care as just something that happens in homes or just as something where somebody comes into your home and gives you a meal and has 20 minutes with you and then off they go we need to think about it in a different way we're going to have more multi-generational houses possibly that's one thing we might want to have learned from the covid crisis what does that mean for our housing it means quite complicated things in terms of building homes that are truly accessible i would add to my list of let's never again build a house that hasn't got blah 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 i would add let's never again build a home that isn't accessible because at the the moment a lot of people's homes even if they wanted to have an elderly relative living with them would be difficult to adapt 
And although we can't go and retrofit every single home that already exists, although I'd like to, we certainly don't need to carry on making the same mistakes. So I think when we are building our homes, as well as when we're designing our social care system, we need to think about the people involved and their needs. And we need to try thinking 40 years in advance. But especially with social care, I want us to start valuing those people properly and showing it meaningfully. OK, thank you, Sangam. I'll come to you now, Karen. And then when you finished, if you could say over to Darren, that might uh, enable us to uh, to get Darren in. And I order from Darren something that I really want. I still can't think of what I'm going to get Darren to do with this great new power of mine. Um, I, it's something that um, I've been uh, talking about uh, for a, a long time. Um, and I, you know, I, I, we employ a small team here in Bristol. Every employer I know. Um, is affected by this. Uh, people, normally women, uh, who have to drop everything, uh, drop of a hat to support and look after older people. And frankly, older people deserve and expect much better dignity from the system to which they have contributed all their lives. They do not want to be dependent on younger children or grandchildren to support them. Um, and we need to start treating them with much more respect. A couple of years ago, the Health and Social Care Committee in Parliament, along with the Communities Committee, worked together on a series of proposals. The evidence is overwhelming. They produced an excellent report with some some options about how to, to tackle this. Um, it will be expensive, but the reality is this is expensive right now um, because of the loss to businesses, from people needing to, to, to give up work, uh, and from the loss to families' income. I don't have the latest figures, but certainly a couple of years ago, on average, families were losing around 20,000, 23,000 pounds from a family income where women have to give up work over the age of 50 to support older people. So the loss in terms of the economy is absolutely massive. Um, and and um, you know, it is everyone's problem. We do need to stop seeing it as everyone's problem. And, and perhaps out of this crisis, um, we are seeing now a lot of people making life-changing decisions. Um, I myself, my mother lives by herself 100 miles away. My, my mother-in-law also. We are in this uh, terrible, vortex of online phone calls to doctors trying to understand medication trying to make sure that there is enough food and support neighbors have been amazing um, the isolation felt by older people now in lockdown it's been phenomenal. It is just dreadful for them. Um, and they are, of course, resilient because they've seen and dealt with many crises in their lives and they feel they want to get through it. I spoke to my aunt who's in her late 80s last night. She said, I'm definitely seeing this through. I want to see more of my grandchildren grow up. Um, they're keeping isolated. They're going to be isolated throughout the next winter. That's a very long time. And of course, the stories we've seen of people looking through windows, not being able to hug children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, that basic human touch that we all rely on. Um, if nothing else propels us to deal with this crisis right now, then that would be a shameful position for this country to be in. You know, we built the National Health Service out of the chaos of the last war. Let's build that National Care Service out of this chaos. Darren, and over to Darren. So over to you. Thank you. I think I've got the gist of the question, but I may not answer it in specific terms, so apologies if that's the case. I mean, if this crisis has shown us anything, it's shown us two things. It's shown us the interconnectedness between the National Health Service and our social care system, and that's caused us many problems, both for uh, people who live in social care settings, but also in terms of managing um, these types of public health issues. And it's also shown us, as Karen said, the amount of work that people do on a voluntary basis for their own families and in their own communities where they were then unable to do so, and, and, and that highlighted the difficulty, but also the amount that they do on behalf of our public services. And, you know, the government said at the election, and they've said since that they're going to bring forward, uh, unfortunately, yet another review, um, but to try to find a consensus on how to deal with social care. Um, we need to get on with that. There's no reason for the delay in that, and we should be able to um, uh, find the time to do that. Um, and it, as you will know, and as Karen has said in the Labour Party, we've long been calling for the integration of the National Health Service um, with the social care system so that you can streamline that connectivity between primary, secondary um, and tertiary care so that it works for patients. Um, but also when I visited Southwood Hospital a few weeks ago to see how they had adjusted to the pandemic and they've been doing a phenomenal job, by the way, and we should we should pay thanks to all of our healthcare workers, but a particular shout out to Andrea Young, who's the CEO of the North Bristol NHS Trust, who was due to retire um, and, and extended her retirement because of the pandemic and provided some fantastic leadership 
um, while she should have been um, uh, packing up her boxes, um, was the digital transformation. So the, 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 because of necessity, the trust has been able to power on with some of the digital programs, some pretty basic things if you look at it from a corporate perspective, but massive things from a public health service perspective. Um, so the um, clinicians were able to do electronic discharging. They were able to take electronic notes across the ward. Patients who were able to were able to have um, appointments via online video conference where they were able to do so, which helped them not having to kind of commute to the hospital when they shouldn't need to because of the pandemic, but probably don't want to in normal times either. And the great and the grand hope of this kind of digital transformation and modernization of the health service, um, alongside the integration of health and social care, is that you can start to free up capacity and funding for the things that are really important. And as Karen said, the kind of face to face social care provision in the home is really, really important. And we all know we've been underfunding social care workers and the social care system for a long time. So if we're making efficiencies in running the system because of digital transformation and because of integration, then we should be able to redirect funding and human resource where it really, really matters. And we, you know, a lot of us have been talking about this for a long time as an academic perspective. And I really hope in the review of the social care system that the government ought to be bringing forward very quickly, um, we'll be able to talk about this in a reality as well. Thank you very much, Darren. Um, uh, just a, a quick question to each of you uh, before we move on to the to the audience questions. And this is about one of our big key themes this autumn for a long time, really. But this autumn and ongoing is about the future of democracy. And there's huge concern around the world, particularly in um, former communist countries, the United States, on about about how democracy is in decline. What 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 would you suggest we do to improve the conditions for uh, uh, for democracy to flourish in this country? And what I'll do is I'll go to Karen first, then to Thangam, and then I've met, put in the notes to Darren. That the question is there, so if you could look in there, um, Karen, please. Well, I mean, I, I think we should, um, you know keep in our in our thoughts we've had three general elections in the last five years um we've got a lot of elections coming up next may and this is a this is a great country and we do have a very um you know lively and engaged democratic tradition i do think as i said in my comments that there are huge problems around the current government's um, proposals on post-brexit internal market I'm a supporter of devolution. I'm a shadow minister for Northern Ireland. I spend a lot of time there. I'm vice chair of British Irish Parliamentary Assembly. I spend a lot of time uh, across the United Kingdom and Ireland. Um, long histories are very different forms of representations. I think we have to respect the differences politically across these islands and build d democratic structures that reflect those, which is what we did in government with the devolution settlement. That's got to be a, a dynamic um, system and will be constantly uh, you know need updating and refreshing but i'm afraid the government's proposals at the moment look like it's not going to do that and it's no respecter of those traditions and i'm particularly worried and have been for a very long time about english devolution i think we don't have the voice we need in england i think that in large part drove some of the divisions we saw over brexit and for the future i think we need a um, I, i'm not convinced of sort of an english parliament but we certainly need a devolution of settlement in England that is rooted, as I've said, in our communities. And that does mean empowering councillors to be able to make decisions. So whether um, in, you know, we have this constant Bristol size problem with the city of Bristol or Greater Bristol or dare I say Avon or Wecca or the Combined Authority or the Western Gateway, whatever it's called. I'm afraid I've, I've been here too long now to hear these different, different um, structural uh, uh, solutions. What does it do for people in South Bristol? And unless there is a strong voice from empowered councillors in South Bristol who have a transparent way of being involved in decision makings that is public, accessible um, and, and changeable, uh, then I'm afraid that will that will start to wither on the vine. So the, the, the government currently is looking like it's sucking powers into Westminster from Brussels and it's sucking up powers from communities into these metro mayors without really any accountability locally. And that's where I think we need a very strong focus in the next few years. As I've said, I wouldn't have mayors, city or metro mayors, but I think if they're here, 
then they have got the governance around them has to be radically changed to keep our trust. And we now have trust in our communities as a result of this crisis. As Thangam has said, knowing our neighbours, knowing our community groups, we have built trust. We need to build on that. This is an opportunity and forge a different constitutional settlement around those metro mayors and English devolution. And English devolution, you'll be interested to know, is one of our themes we'll be looking at probably in around October time. So we'll be coming back to you on that. Thank you. I'd love to. Thank you. Uh, oh, well, first of all, um, the risk of being controversial, I think reports of the decline in democratic engagement are hugely overhyped. Mm -hmm. Over the last four years, I would say that there can't be many people in this country who haven't told their political representatives what they think on the subject of their relationship with Europe. Whether they were for it or against it, we certainly heard it. And I could not believe the number of people who, I mean, I got stopped sometimes in the street in London where I don't live and I'm not an MP for by people who said, oh, I saw you announcing the vote last night during the Brexit votes, which is a really niche techie thing for people to have been tuning in on the telly box to watch us announcing votes. Now, whether we agreed with that or not, people were certainly engaged. And I think that in the last few months, what I found as well is thousands of people email me as my staff will confirm every month. I think that's true for a lot of us as MPs. But for instance, even I have surprises even in the last few months when I would say this is still evidence of democratic engagement. It's still evidence that democracy is still working. When people were angry at Dominic Cummings um, back in May bank holiday, when they were upset, and it still chokes me up to think about some of the things I had to read that bank holiday Monday, when they were upset about feeling that they'd missed out on, in some cases, absolutely tragically missing out on somebody's death or somebody's wedding that never happened or all sorts of things that really matter that you're never going to get back ever. When they wrote to someone, they didn't write to some random person, they wrote to their member of parliament. They knew that their member of parliament was the right person to tell and they knew to ask their member of parliament to hold the prime minister's assistant to account. Now, I think I've taken that as evidence of quite a high level of democratic engagement, particularly as I measured. And it was a four figure sum. I had a four figure sum of people emailing me on that one topic in a 24 hour period. Most of them had never emailed me before on anything. But they all knew that I was the person to email when they were angry about something that they felt wasn't democratic. I have to say, um, the risk of, of pinching maybe Darren's line, I'm missing debate in person. I mean, this is lovely, but I think debate in person, you, you're missing out on stuff. You're missing out on all sorts of cues and debate in the House of Commons. And I have been to two in the last couple of weeks. It's not the same. You're not getting the same level of engagement. We're also not able to scrutinise ministers as we mm. properly should be able to. And I think that we've done the right thing. And I really valued the virtual vote, virtual parliament and the remote voting and proxy voting things we've been able to do. But it isn't the same. It's not the same as the, what politics should be about, which is me understanding the needs of the 130,000 people I represent. And when I see a minister walking past me in the corridor, be able to go, oi, you person, I need to talk to you about what some of my constituents need, as well as in the chamber, the out of the chamber stuff. I think one final plea would be support your local councillors. There's going to be council elections next year. Uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid to say I'm the same as Karen. I didn't want an elected mayor for either city or metro, but we've got them. And a lot of people say, but I don't even know who they are. And I think that's a two way street. I think taking some responsibility to find out is one thing. But also, I think if people don't know who their metro mayor or their city mayor is, actually, I'd be surprised if anyone does know who Marvin is after the last few months. If anyone doesn't know who their metro mayor is or their councillors are, A, find out. But B, that tells us as politicians that we've got a job of work to do, to think about how we're communicating. I don't know about any other colleagues, but I've really missed the door knocking. But that, in any case, it gives you a massive slice of life that you don't otherwise get that never comes to your inbox. But I think we're going to have to think about different ways of communicating. OK, thanks very much. Um, Karen, if you could tell Darren his, his chance to speak. Darren, you're up. Do you think that's me now? Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> very good. Um, Look, when we, uh, when I, I think a lot about this because I've always tried to be innovative as an MP's office in how we engage constituents in democratic debate. And, and my observations are, are, are twofold. Firstly, is that, you know, we, we have a representative democracy. Most people don't really want to be involved in the day to day decision making. That's why they elect MPs and councillors and mayors. Um, who can get on with the job, but they do want to feel like they can have a say. So the question is, well, what does having a say actually mean? It's not just shouting at a wall and not being listened to. It's about being heard, but also having an effect because of the representations that you've made through your elected representatives. Now, we're not always going to agree on everything. And of course, 
you know, certainly as opposition MPs, unfortunately, we can't always just make things happen because we are not in power in Westminster, um, uh, which is difficult. Um, but the question is, uh, how do you really give people that kind of impactful um, uh, empowerment to, to have a say and have an outcome? And I think there are two things to that. One is the method of engagement, two is the institutional delivery. On the method of engagement, I have to agree with Sangam. I'm someone that's always whittled on about the benefits of technology and having to do more on it. Um, but I have to say the physical uh, aspect of representation, I have very much missed. I feel like I'm less connected to my constituents um, uh, in the last few months than I have been since 2017 because I haven't been knocking on doors. I haven't been with my pasting table outside the co-op. I haven't been stopped in the coffee shop. You know, I've not had the physical meetings with people. And equally in Parliament, uh, as Sangam said, you, it doesn't, it's not the same. You can't really hold ministers to account in the same dynamic, in the same way, whether it's on my select committee or on the floor of the House or wherever it might be. So there's, uh, th there is value to that. However, the one thing I have seen really improve, uh, my coffee mornings, for example, where normally we can only really do 10 people max, otherwise you can't hear everybody, where I've been doing them on, on Zoom, I've had kind of 50 people coming along and people have been able to engage in a much um, easier way than perhaps taking a, a Saturday morning to come and talk to me um, in, a, in a coffee shop. So there's been some benefits to that. And we're going to, we, we've been trying things like citizens assemblies and we do kind of um, service level, uh, it sounds a bit corporate, but service level kind of surveys with constituents to make sure we're using the right channels and providing the right turnaround times and the right quality of answers and the right access. Um, but the second point is the institutional issue. You know, how do you really affect outcomes by getting involved in the first place outside of just elections? And obviously elections are very important. And I would agree with uh, Karen that the kind of institutional structure is very confusing and in my view, not enormously effective. So my committee is doing a, an inquiry on post-pandemic economic growth. And we've just launched two sub-inquiries, one uh, taking the evidence on the industrial strategy, but the other looking at devolution and whether that's actually structured in the right way to deliver growth. And I'm not saying that any particular level is good or bad, but in Bristol, we've got our councillors, we've got the city mayor, we've got the local enterprise partnership, we've got the West England Combined Authority, the directly elected regional mayor, and now the Western Gateway, uh, as well as all the other groups that interact. Um, I'm not really sure any one of those layers has been given the proper empowerment or financing to take decisions that work for local people in the context of actually very significant centralisation in Westminster. You know, I shadow Bayes. I don't think Bayes is able to take any decisions right now unless Downing Street signed off on it. There's, there's, there's very significant centralisation going on whilst you've got this kind of confused institutional structure that doesn't really make sense to local people. So we're going to be reviewing that because if you go to Wigan or Sedgefield, they've just got council. That, that might be the right answer, who knows? But why have we got six tiers in Bristol and one tier somewhere else? And, and then how does it work in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland when we are uh, you know, supporters of the United Kingdom? We want it to work for the whole country. So we've got to kind of make those points connect. And as MPs, we can do all of the stuff on engaging with constituents and we all do that. Um, but we do have to get the outcome right. So people feel like it's a good use of their time to engage in democratic debate outside of elections so they can really see outcomes. And we've got it, we've got a lot of work to do to get that right, in my view. Thank you very much, Darren. Um, I'm going to take some more audience questions and I won't ask you to all answer them, except where it's, we can, but I'll come to you individually on relevant questions. And the first is to you, Thang, um, which this question's got a lot of votes, uh, is about given the um, changes to uh, the planning rules, which the government is proposing, is this going to have an impact on, on creating better living for people, uh, greener living, nicer spaces to live in and so on? Yes, and it's not a good impact. I mean, the government has presented planning as the obstacle to better living. I don't think the planning system's perfect by any manner of means, but a planning system whereby people's locally elected representatives on the council get to scrutinise planning proposals. That's important because it's councillors who often know exactly where the green space is lacking or where there needs to be some extra funding for a playground or a school. It's councillors who in that decision making process get to decide that there needs to be more truly affordable housing or more money for community infrastructure. If you cut planning out, you cut all of that out and that's a problem. They've also put a great emphasis on this thing called permitted development. Permitted development it's not it, it's it's a thing which when you first hear about it you think oh that makes sense you know empty office buildings should be, be able you should be able to convert them into dwellings well okay you should but you also need to think about what the infrastructure is behind that are they being turned into homes that are fit for human habitation or are they as is often unfortunately the case being turned into rabbit hutches and again my covid lens here lots of people have had to live through the lockdown in one of those permitted developments with in some cases no door no windows on bedroom walls no daylight. 
And I dread to think what that's been like. So if we want good quality homes, we need more uh, engagement with local elected representatives, not less. And what the government is doing, I fear, is cutting out that process to the detriment of local people's needs and the environment. Thank you. Um, Karen, the next question's for you, is about childcare. Now, the question is in relation to COVID, but also about longer term childcare. Why isn't this part seen as part of the kind of economic in the infrastructure you talked about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, the, the childcare sector has been precarious for a long time because we do rely on, and it's, you know, part of the government's ethos since 2010, um, they cut back on our Sure Start family centres massively and they, they, they pulled out other money from local government to support these. Um, and uh, we rely on then private providers now lots of these private providers i'm not i'm not against a mixed economy here but by relying on the private providers who are now themselves struggling um ironically sometimes because obviously their workers often need to have kids in school for example um they they are struggling so women that are looking particularly women who, who tend to be looking for the childcare, are um not finding there's any capacity in the system currently so where we're wanting uh people with children to come back to work either the kids aren't all in school um, and or there is no childcare capacity for them to be back to work so again really just as in the social care system it's really shining that spotlight on why childcare is not someone else's issue it is everybody's issue in the economy um, and you know we can't allow the market to be the sole determiner of this provision it is as important that's why some of us talk about this as an infrastructure issue you know we need roads in this city we need trains we need buses to work but we also need uh, a caring system established for both childcare and social care that is flexible that is there's a, that, that people can afford um because otherwise the women that are um currently doing so badly out of this covid crisis um, will do worse and of course many of the reasons that women are are, are in insecure work um, are in these new self-employed schemes etc then they're not getting the government support is because they have elected to have this sort of flexible work I did it myself when my children were younger um, in order to allow you to look after children at the same time thank you Karen um, I'll come to Darren but I'm not sure that um I, I put a question in the chat. I don't know whether Darren can see the chat, um, but Karen, if you could warn Darren, I put the question in the chat for him. But I'm, in the meantime, I just asked Thangam. One question we've had Thangam is about mental health and about people and about people mental health during the crisis, but also long term mental health. Could you talk a little bit about that? Oh. Well, perhaps again, just what we should do, really. Again, well, we we first of all, quick quick answer: we should definitely use the COVID lens because, again, going through this experience has taught us an awful lot about what affects everybody's mental health. How most of us have found it difficult to be away from people we love. How we've probably mostly worked out who those people are to a much greater degree because that's how we decide who we're going to bother to zoom on a Sunday when we've really had enough of zooming all week. Uh, I think most of us have learned sometimes the hard way actually which things really make us very unhappy uh, which things are going to develop potentially into long-term mental health problems if they're not fixed but i also think that we've learned that our mental health carers can sometimes provide mental health care in new and innovative ways but that doesn't always work and some people again i come back to the democracy thing need to be somewhere in person with a mental health support person who is skilled so we need i need I, I believe that everyone will probably agree it was on the Labour Party's last manifesto, I think it was on the Tory Party's last general election manifesto, that mental health and physical health should have parity. And what that means isn't necessarily that they each receive the same amount of funding, but that they receive equivalently the same amount of respect, and also that both need to be brought into public health, that public health has a role to play in mental health and should be given, in my view, much greater respect. OK, thank you. Karen, if you could tell Darren that... Um, it's his turn to speak. Can you do that? Karen, it's your turn to speak okay. about the national okay. recovery. Yes, TG. Thank you. Thank you. I can see the question and my colleagues pointing at me is helpful. So thank you for that. Um, uh, so the opportunity from the pandemic is that we're going to be spending an enormous amount of public money um, to kickstart the economy um, and to try to recover from the economic costs of the pandemic. So this is a kind of once in a generation, if not longer, opportunity 
to think about what type of economy do we want to stimulate and grow for the future. Um, and uh, the, as I said, the committee that I chair is looking at post-pandemic economic growth, the language that I use is a personal view, obviously the committee is cross-party, but my personal view is that we need a more inclusive, productive and sustainable economy. And what I mean by that is it needs to be more inclusive because we know that inequality um, is still a massive problem in our country. And I would much rather we had a, an economy where everyone was able to take advantage of the opportunities without government having to redistribute, um, having failed to make an inclusive economy in the first place. I don't think we've ever really got that right, but we should try to think about how we can improve that. Um, the question on productivity is really important. The British economy has not been productive for a very, very long time. Um, I think that's related to lots of issues, but the one I often talk about is around technology and um, digitization, uh, especially in our SME um, and our supply chain sector. Um, there are other countries that are much better than we are at that, and it requires, I think, governments to provide some leadership and to collaborate with business on making that happen. And the last one, which is an obvious one, which I know probably everybody on this call will agree with, is that a more sustainable economy. Uh, we know the challenges that we face in trying to reach our net zero statutory target, um, um, and uh, we've got to get a move on. The Committee on Climate Change has said that we made no progress in the last year, that we're falling behind on our fifth and sixth carbon budget, that we're, you know, we're co-presiding over COP26 next December, where we want to show the world how it can be done. We've got to get our in-house in order before we try to lecture others on what they ought to be able to do. And the question specifically talks about the UN's SDGs, the development goals, um, and I commend uh, the implementation of the SDGs in one city plan at sea level. We need to make sure that happens across the country, uh, because the whole point of the SDGs is, is about global cooperation. And my real concern at the moment is the pandemic has started to highlight underlying geopolitical frictions um, uh, between um, you know, China and Russia, but also some other countries and the kind of West or the Five Eyes nations. And now more than ever, we need to be collaborative, collaborating um, globally, because if we don't, we're not going to meet our climate change objectives. We can't just have a fight on one issue, whether it's Huawei or power or whatever it might be, um, and forget about these big issues facing the planet, where it will be our failure um, for not making progress where we ought to be collaborating on the things that we can make progress on. Of course, we can disagree on issues about human rights, um, and we should uh, call those out. But on climate change, we ought to be able to agree, and we need to be able to make sure those channels still exist for that to happen. And the SDGs are a really important channel for that work. And so it's great that we're doing it at city level, but we need to see the UK talking about it much more nationally, but also in the opportunity we have um, uh, when the government always talks about, you know, world leading and a global Britain trying to define its kind of role in the world in a post-Brexit, post-Covid world to show the type of SDG related leadership, um, whether it's through COP26, the UN, the G7 or whatever, whatever multinationals that we um, that we function in. Um, we're, we're running out of time, but because we started five minutes late, if you could just bear with me for two more questions, because I'd like to get the audience question in. Karen, I'll take this one. I'll put this one to you. Given the, the transport changes that we've all experienced under COVID and the pandemic, do you see this as an opportunity to reboot transport in, in cities? Um, you know, the question is asked about scooters and about cycling and things like that. Um. <laughs> I mean, we've got real problems in South Bristol with transport. It's at the moment, you know, the, the, the youngsters that need to get back into City of Bristol College to get the skills, the training for the jobs that should be out there. Um, the buses are passing them because the buses just don't have the capacity to take more people. Um, I don't know what we're going to do about that problem, uh, given social distancing that needs to keep going. The, the problem, you know, I'm not against you know, new zippy forms of transport to go to be going around. But, you know, these things are expensive. I know you can start people talk about hiring them. Um, people have got to have the physical capacity to use some of these things. I think jostling cyclists and scooters and whatever else on, on highways and roads is, is, is problematic. Um, you know, we need, where are people traveling to and what for um, is part of the issue. That's why I'm so keen on the apprenticeships and the City of Bristol College, for example. They've got, you know, places in, you know, we've got the, play, you know, the skill center in Hengro was deliberately built at the center of the Metro bus scheme in order to support economic development in South Bristol. Part of it's been built, the rest of it hasn't. So I'm afraid, you know, we had the promise of a new road in South Bristol with a Metro bus linking into Hengrove, the Skills Academy, the hospital and the leisure centre with the housing as a massive regeneration. It's done half its job 
but it's not it's not done the next bit and that's you know that's my shout out to the metro mayor who i'm having this running dialogue about the metro bus getting kids on it we've got transport surplus for youngsters to be able to go to college we give it back to the treasury it's an absolute scandal and other centers in the uk are using transport to get it to those youngsters so they can access further education and decent apprenticeships in order to get the skills to get the jobs so you know i'm, I'm all for having these zippy new exciting fancy new ways of doing things but i'd really quite like to get the basics first and i'd quite like to get the promises that have been made to people in south bristol over the last two decades delivered before we start adding anything else on top thank you very much and just a, a quick question to to all of you and again karen i'm very grateful for you translating this to darren i think i think talk with you guys next maybe but, it, but, it's, um, but it, it's about, someone said, um, what advice would you give to someone? I think it's from the, the Bristol City Youth Council in, in becoming an MP in the future. What's the one piece of advice you could give? And if I could start with Thangam for that. Uh, develop stamina. Listen to lots of people with whom you don't agree. Um, try to see things from as many different points of view as possible and recognise that political ideology isn't a bad thing. It's actually part of everyone's got political ideology. They've got values. But so find a political party or a grouping in which your values are well reflected and get involved in campaigning. And you don't have to be an MP to be involved in politics. Do other stuff as well. There is plenty of ways of doing politics. Being an MP is only one of very, very many. Karen? Yes, I'd, I'd agree with that. So, Darren, for you, the question is about um, the youth mayors. How um, how you, how do you become an MP? How do you get involved in politics? So, I'm going to go next, and then it's up to you, Darren. Um, look, I, I always say to people. I mean, I actually this morning I advertised for a, a six month uh, caseworker job. I've had a hundred applications for a six month post with the most amazing amount of skills. Um, of, of people who applied. If anyone's listened to this call, thank you for applying. Um, it, you know, people do want to work in and around politics. It's always very popular. Well, I've always said what I thought to myself. I've always been involved in politics, but I wanted to go off and get a proper job and a proper career. Um, I was much more interested in uh, running services locally um, and understanding how organisations, businesses and public organisations worked. And I do always say to people, you know, get yourself skilled up in, in, in jobs in the real world. It doesn't matter what it is. I totally agree with Sam. Understanding how services, how laws affect people, what, they, what they're like on the ground, no substitute for it. Almost doesn't matter what that experience is, is with people. And tolerance, learn tolerance, you know, two ears, one mouth. And uh, from, from that, um, whatever the future holds. I'm really optimistic about that. I've got 20 year old, an 18 year old and a 15 year old at home, listening to them and their mates and, and so on. It's a turbulent time but um, it's it's and a difficult time and I don't underestimate the mental health strain I really don't but it's also a massive opportunity to forge a future in what is also a dynamic global time for people with decent values and tolerance and ability to listen and learn and help people and Darren Thanks. Darren, I, I think, yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, I, well, first of all, we should all be involved in politics because we're all citizens in a democracy, as we've been talking about today. So whether it's about turning up to a coffee morning or a citizens assembly or getting in touch with an elected representative or coming to a town hall meeting or taking part in a hustings at an election and, of course, registering and voting in an election, um, we should all be doing that. Um, for people that want to work in politics, I think that's slightly different, um, either on a voluntary basis or a, or a paid basis. Now, I'm someone that when I was younger, experienced the, the benefit of the power of politics, it completely transformed my opportunities in life and, and, and the life that my, that my family and I had when we were um, in Lawrence Weston and Shirehampton growing up. And so from a very early age, I recognised the power of that and wanted to do it. But to go to Karen's point, I also recognised that um, in politics, I think it was, um, I can't remember who said it, but we're all kind of ships on the horizon without any disrespect to colleagues. You know, we, we come and go um, over time and we shouldn't get too kind of caught up in our own um, aspirations or ego in politics. We're merely shepherds and trying to do the best job whilst we've got the chance to serve. And so getting a job that pays the bills, should you either not get elected or get elected and then get unelected, um, is really, really important. And so that's you know why I went off to law school and became a lawyer before I ran to be um, an MP. But the last thing I would say is that, um, of course, we're not just, we don't just do these things in our own right. I can't tell you how much hard work my small uh, team of staff do in Westminster and Bristol to make sure that the service we deliver to my constituents is what they experience. Uh, and so all of them are essentially part of being an MP and functioning as a member of parliament as an office, as opposed to just those of us that are put our faces on 
billboards and buses every few years. Um, so there's lots of ways to engage, and I would encourage people to do so. The, the person who asked that question said, would one of you go along to speak to the Bristol Youth Council? So I'll leave them to express that invitation to them direct. We are out of time and I, you're very busy people. We haven't been able to get to all of the questions. Indeed, many of the questions I wanted to ask you as well. Um, but we will run another one of these later on the year, hopefully. Um, I do apologise for the technical problems that we had. Um, I'm very grateful for people who listened in and asked questions and put comments. And I'm very grateful to our speakers. Uh, to Thangam, to Darren and to Karen and to Karen as well for being a kind of proxy for me as well uh, with Darren. So thank you very much for that. Uh, good luck with all that's going on and have a good rest of the summer and look forward to talking with you again. This is Festival thank Ideas you. Online. We've got more events coming up on Thursday. We've got Anne Applebaum on the twilight of democracy. So look forward to that very much. Thank you very much and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.